Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at some of our top stories. Texas Governor Greg Abbott ordering random school inspections to make sure schools are prepared to respond to school shootings as Uvalde says goodbye to more victims of last week's attack. Iowa, Mississippi, and South Dakota are among seven states holding primary elections on June 7th. Find out who's favored to win among Senate and gubernatorial candidates. A new report shows at least 19,000 ballots counted in Arizona's 2020 general election were late and invalid. An election integrity group says the ballots could have affected results from the state. Record fuel prices hit the trucking industry as well as everyday Americans. The price per gallon is now above $4 in all 50 states. And the national average for a gallon of gas is nearly $4.60. An armed man killed at least four people inside a medical building in Tulsa, Oklahoma on Wednesday. It's the latest in a series of recent mass shootings across the United States. Local police said the gunman, who was armed with a rifle and a handgun, also fatally shot himself. The suspect's identity and motives are so far unclear. Tulsa's deputy police chief said police arrived on site at St. Francis Hospital three minutes after receiving a call about the shooting. They made contact with the victims and the suspect five minutes later. 1652, 452 hours. Um, our dispatch received a call of an active shooter at the Natalie Medical Building at uh, 6457 South Yale Avenue. We had officers arrive at the location uh, at 456, so a three minute uh, response time, and made contact with victims and the suspect at 501. Uh, and that was them making their way to the second floor. The officers that did arrive uh, were hearing shots in the building, and that's what directed them to the second floor. Police responses have come under increased scrutiny after a man gunned down 19 children and two teachers in the Uvalde, Texas school classroom last week, while officers waited outside for nearly an hour. And speaking of Texas, Uvalde said goodbye on Wednesday to a teacher who was killed in last week's school shooting and her husband, who died two days later. This as the governor looks for ways to prevent more school shootings. And today's Jessica Beatty has more. Mourner said goodbye Wednesday to Robb Elementary School teacher Irma Garcia, who died in last week's attack, and her husband, Joe, who died two days later from an apparent heart attack after visiting his wife's memorial. They were high school sweethearts and would have been married 25 years later this month. They're survived by four children. Mourners also said goodbye to 10-year-old Jose Flores Jr. He made the honor roll and received a certificate hours before the shooting. His father told CNN his son loved baseball and was always full of energy. Meanwhile, law enforcement faces mounting scrutiny about their response. Uvalde's mayor says victims' families deserve answers. And we will make sure that they get the answers and it's transparent. And if we made mistakes, we'll own those mistakes. One thing that could help is witness footage. The day of the shooting, businessman Mike Palacios was filming next to a Border Patrol unit and could hear radio chatter. It was a hot mic, so we were able to hear what was going on inside the school. Um, So at that moment, I captured what seemed to be a little girl saying that she had been shot you know, uh, asking for help. Bill Burns was inside his parents' house just south of the school when he heard gunshots. He says he saw police come in and lock down the school quickly. And when he saw children coming through the windows, it felt like, okay, great. They're getting the kids out. You know, they're going to be okay. Um, I, I had no idea what had already transpired. The Justice Department will review law enforcement's response and the delay in confronting the shooter. Burns says he gave his video to authorities and hopes it can help deliver a more accurate timeline. Meanwhile, Texas Governor Greg Abbott is looking for ways to prevent this from happening again. On Wednesday, he ordered state officials to start carrying out random inspections at schools. He says it'll help find weak points and determine if schools are prepared to implement and follow their emergency plans. Abbott says this will improve accountability and make sure schools follow the plans they create. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. A grand jury has indicted the suspected shooter in last month's deadly grocery store shooting in Buffalo, New York. The jury returned a 25-count indictment against Peyton Gendron Wednesday. 
According to court documents, Gendron is facing 10 counts of first-degree murder, 10 counts of second-degree murder as a hate crime, and three counts of attempted murder as a hate crime. He also has a domestic terror charge and a weapons charge. Authorities say Gendron opened fire inside of Topps Friendly Market on May 14th, shooting 13 people, 10 were killed. Investigators say he was motivated by hate to target a predominantly black community. Gendron is slated to be arraigned Thursday. Newly uncovered records from Maricopa County show 19,000 invalid ballots were counted in Arizona's 2020 general election. An election integrity group says the amount is enough to have potentially swayed results in the state's presidential election. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg reports. Arizona law requires ballots to be received no later than 7 p.m. on election day by the county to be considered valid. Yet newly uncovered records document over 20,000 ballots were transported from the U.S. Postal Service after Election Day, of which only 934 were rejected by Maricopa County. In Arizona's 2020 presidential election, President Joe Biden came in with 10,457 more votes than former President Donald Trump. It is impossible to know if the results would be different if the late ballots had not been counted. Verity Vote obtained documents from the county and reported their findings. In response to requests, Maricopa County made ballot receipt of delivery documents available for public inspection from October 13th through November 6th, 2020. Verity Vote investigators noticed the documents from November 4th, 2020, the day after the election, were missing. It took nearly seven months to get the documents after Verity Vote made multiple requests to Maricopa County for the November 4th receipt of delivery. The receipt shows 18,000 ballots were picked up from the post office the day after the November 3rd election. The county also documents receiving 1,000 ballots on November 5th and 1,500 ballots on November 6th, combining for a total of 20,500 late ballots, but the actual number could be much higher. A letter from the county recorder in response to Verity Vote's document requests says the November 4th receipt provided does not represent all ballots received that day. Another anomaly is the number of ballots collected November 4th compared to other days around that time. Voters were instructed to mail ballots by October 27th to be sure their ballots arrived on time. By October 30th, the number of ballots coming by mail dropped sharply, but saw a massive spike the day after the election. On October 28th, the county received 58,500 ballots from the post office. Then the number dropped down to a few thousand a day leading up to the deadline. Arizona has 11 electoral votes. In the final tally, Biden had 74 more electoral votes than Trump, according to the official record. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Voters in seven states will head to the polls on June 7th for Republican and Democratic primaries. Let's take a look at the races scheduled in Iowa, Mississippi, and South Dakota. Iowa will hold a Senate race and gubernatorial race this November, but fierce competition isn't expected. I'm Chuck Grassley, and I approve this message. Iowa is changing. Who would have thought that we'd become a major energy producer or attract high-tech jobs? Incumbent Republican Senator Chuck Grassley is seeking his eighth term. In the Republican primary, he will face off with State Senator Jim Carlin. There are no polls so far on the GOP primary, but Grassley has raised 10 times more funds than Carlin and has the endorsement of former President Trump. You know, I think it's more about what I do as a governor, not so much about my gender. I think it sends a strong message for young girls across the state of Iowa and country, really, to know that, you know, if you have a dream, anything is possible if you're willing. Incumbent Republican Governor Kim Reynolds is running unopposed in the primary. She is heavily favored to win re-election. South Dakota will also have a Senate race and a gubernatorial race. Neither of them are expected to be competitive either. Incumbent Republican Senator John Thune and incumbent Republican Governor Kristi Noem are both predicted to see clear-cut primary wins. That experience has prepared Kristi to lead South Dakota, to reform welfare, reduce violent crime, improve our schools, and grow our economy. Trump had asked Noem to challenge Thune, who did not support challenging the 2020 presidential election results. Instead, Noem opted to seek re-election as governor. Both are expected to get re-elected. And over in Mississippi, the state isn't holding Senate or gubernatorial races. Instead, all four congressional delegates, three Republicans and one Democrat, are seeking re-election. But according to the Cook Political Report, none of those seats are expected to flip. 
Republican Congressman Stephen Palazzo has won the past six elections in Mississippi's 4th Congressional District, but recent campaign finance allegations may shake up his re-election bid. In March 2021, the nonpartisan Office of Congressional Ethics publicly released a report. It suggested Palazzo may have violated House rules, standards, and federal law. A 2020 report by left-wing watchdog group Campaign Legal Center says Palazzo may have used campaign funds to pay himself nearly $200,000. A spokesman for Palazzo told Mississippi Today that the allegations against him are politically motivated and that the congressman hopes the Ethics Committee will clear his name. Palazzo serves on the powerful House Appropriations Committee, which allocates federal funding. It's federal spending. This year, six candidates are running against him in the Republican primary. Some are criticizing Palazzo on various issues, including the alleged ethics violations. Four Republicans are vying to oust him in the 2022 primary. Record fuel prices are hitting the trucking industry hard, as well as everyday Americans. The jump is raising costs for businesses and consumers and fueling widespread inflation. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. Oil prices jumped again this week after the European Union agreed to ban about 90% of oil imports from Russia by the end of the year. American drivers are feeling the pain at the pump, as U.S. gas prices hit a record high of $4.62 per gallon on Monday. The price of diesel is also hitting new highs, rising about 70% from a year ago. So obviously it is squeezing the profits. Um, and. I don't see a short-term end to it. I think our, these elevated prices will continue. Hopefully, we're getting somewhere near the peak. Roadstar Trucking runs a fleet of about 25 trucks delivering goods in Northern California and passes along most of the increase to its customers through a fuel surcharge. Unfortunately for the public, you know, when diesel prices uh, are so elevated, uh, we have to pass that through. There, there's just no, no other way to do it. Um, That will ultimately be reflected in the prices that the consumer pays. Russia's invasion of Ukraine in March has fueled the sharp spike in oil prices. Before the Russian invasion, the oil market was tight. Inventories were low, demand was rising, there's a little spare capacity. And then the Russian invasion has removed some supply from the U.S. and Europe. So that made a, a tough problem even worse. Meanwhile, New York cut the state's gas taxes by 16 cents a gallon on Wednesday. I mean, every sentence counts because, I mean, I was just talking to a family member in Florida. She's paying $50 uh, to fill up the tank. I'm paying $80 to fill up the tank. So, I mean, I, I work paycheck to paycheck, so it's tough. It's tough. Every cent counts for sure. The reprieve will last until the end of the year. The price per gallon is now above $4 in all 50 states, while the national average for a gallon of regular grade gasoline is nearly $4.60. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Coming up, Amber Heard is liable for defamation against Johnny Depp. Jurors awarded the actor over $10 million. Find out more right here on NTD News. Actor Johnny Depp won a defamation lawsuit against his ex-wife, Amber Heard. A jury found both sides liable for defamation, but awarded Depp much more in damages. Here's some analysis from legal experts. A Virginia jury ruled that Aquaman actress Amber Heard defamed ex-husband Johnny Depp, wrapping up the six-week-long trial. A Los Angeles lawyer said Heard's performance at the trial led to the outcome. She lied about facts that had nothing to do with the alleged abuse. She lied about donating $7 million to charity. She lied about not leaking the video and tipping off TMZ. And I think based on those lies, the jurors rejected her testimony. Jurors awarded over $10 million in damages to Deb, a legal victory for the actor. The panel also found in favor of Hurt in a counterclaim against Deb, awarding her $2 million in damages. Heard wrote on social media that she was disappointed and heartbroken by the verdict. She accused the jury of ignoring the mountain of evidence against her ex-husband, as well as the key issue of freedom of speech. Amber Heard can certainly appeal, but there's not a very good basis for appeal. And if she does, interest will start to accrue on the judgment. The other issue is you can't appeal a factual finding. The jurors finding that she acted maliciously, that she lied, that she defamed it. You can only appeal a legal error. And I don't see 
a clear legal error made by the judge in this case. She called it pretty fairly, in my opinion. Depp sued his ex-wife over an opinion piece she wrote for the Washington Post in 2018. In the article, Heard described herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. Heard filed a countersuit claiming that Depp smeared her by calling her allegations a hoax. Testimony was live-streamed widely on social media. Variety editor Clayton Davis said neither side won as they both exhibited some toxic behavior. I think one of the greatest injustices possibly was the airing of this trial because I think no matter what happens, and again, I want to make this very clear, not saying who was right or wrong, I think seeing what happened here will prevent legitimate sexual abuse survivors or physical abuse survivors to come forward with the fear that they may get dragged through the media or dragged by social media, you know, when they plead their case, if they're in fact telling the truth. I think that part is the most heartbreaking of this entire situation. Johnny Depp also responded to the verdict on social media. He said the jury gave him his life back and a new chapter has finally begun. A federal judge says the man who shot and wounded President Reagan in 1981 is on track for unconditional release in mid-June. John Hinckley Jr. was found not guilty by reason of insanity in a jury trial in 1982. He was treated at a mental hospital and released more than 30 years later in 2016. He's lived in Williamsburg, Virginia since then, first with his mother, then on his own after her death in August. He's been under strict travel and internet restrictions. In September, he and the Justice Department reached an agreement to get rid of the conditions. Reagan suffered a punctured lung in the March 30, 1981 assassination attempt, but recovered. Three other people were wounded. A group of strangers rushing to help a man trapped by a vehicle after a crash in South Carolina. It happened in Myrtle Beach. The city's police released this video of the accident on Saturday. A car ran into a man and a woman riding a motorcycle. The woman was knocked off the bike while the man was trapped under the vehicle. As you can see, suddenly a group of onlookers rushed to the car to help. As police showed up, more than a dozen people joined them and physically moved the car as someone pulled the man to safety. Police say the man and woman were there taken to the hospital and treated for non-life-threatening injuries. No word yet on whether the driver of the vehicle faces any charges. Local officials are using the dramatic rescue to urge drivers to practice defensive driving and safe distances on the road this summer season. Gilberto Orihuela, a former leader of Colombia's once powerful Cali cartel, has died in the United States. He was serving a 30-year drug trafficking sentence. He was one of the heads of the Cali Drug Cartel, an organization that was strengthened after the death of Pablo Escobar and influenced crime and politics in Colombia. According to the United States Federal Prison Agency, the man died in a North Carolina medical center. The agency did not specify his cause of death, but he suffered from various illnesses, including colon and prostate cancer. That's according to his legal team in a motion seeking his release in 2019. He was serving a sentence for drug trafficking after being extradited from Colombia in December 2004, and he pleaded guilty to trafficking cocaine into the U.S. According to Colombia's Department of Justice, the former leader and the Cali cartel exported more than 200 tons of cocaine into the U.S. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And still to come, Denmark votes to join the European Union's defense pact in a signal of solidarity against Russia. Politicians on the left and right came together for the move. And Russians experiencing the political and economic fallout from their country's invasion of Ukraine are fleeing to the tiny Balkan country of Montenegro. Find out more after this short break. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN. 
guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well rested in the morning. That's why I invented my pillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial to bring you my BOGO extravaganza. For example, you get one of my Giza Dream bed sheets and you get a second set absolutely free. Or my six piece towel sets. Buy one set, get another one absolutely free. Or get my classic premium My Pillow and get another one absolutely free. So call the number on your screen or go to mypillow.com and use your promo code to get my buy one, get one free offers and get deep discounts on all My Pillow products. The leaders of Denmark's center-left ruling party and center-right opposition stand united after the country decided to join the European Union's defense policy. The final results of a referendum into the issue signal the latest shift among Nordic countries. They want to deepen defense ties in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. After most votes were counted, the Danish prime minister and the leader of the opposition party both hailed the decision. Denmark is the only EU member that was not part of the European Union's defense and security policy. Final results show almost 67% of voters were in favor of joining the EU's so-called common security and defense policy. It was the largest recorded show of support in a referendum on an EU matter in Denmark. The vote is a win for those in favor of greater EU cooperation, but those against it argue that the EU's defense pact is strained by bureaucracy. And they say Denmark's participation in EU military operations will be too costly. Video footage purportedly shows U.S. volunteer soldiers shooting a rocket at a Russian armored vehicle in Ukraine. This follows a Department of Homeland Security warning that Americans volunteering in the conflict could increase extremism at home. The Homeland Security Bulletin was obtained by transparency group Property of the People. The bulletin says some Americans were recruited by Ukraine's Azov Battalion, a group that has drawn controversy over its neo-Nazi ties. The DHS based its assessment on open source information as well as Customs and Border Protection agents' encounters with Americans departing for Ukraine. The department says they are concerned that training received in Ukraine could be used to bolster U.S.-based militia and white nationalist groups. Many Russians are trying to escape the political and economic fallout from their country's invasion of Ukraine. Now, they're settling by the thousands in the tiny Balkan country of Montenegro. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. Former opposition activist Elena Zaslavska was at her apartment in downtown Moscow when there was a knock on the door soon after the invasion. It was the police. The visit was a clear warning. Within days, she and her husband had packed their bags and were headed for Montenegro. We have ended up here because there was no possibility whatsoever to be in Russia under its current government, because everything that goes on there was incompatible with our views and understanding of the world. They have settled in a village near the Adriatic, where they say life is calm and the climate is pleasant. They survive on their pensions. We can go back in case there will be no possibilities for staying in Montenegro any longer or wherever else. But that's unlikely. And we would have to go. Or the main thing, if suddenly Russian President Vladimir Putin dies or something happens to him, perhaps we will return. Murat Gelman is a prominent gallery owner and outspoken critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin. 
he too fled to Montenegro. Putin's problems are not because of poor analysts or because he has little money and so on. The problem is that he took the side of evil. He violates thou shall not kill. He violates all international laws, Christian laws, the law and the development of humankind, that the wheel of history aims to move forward. Gelman said that among Russians seeking refuge in Montenegro were wealthy business people and their families, as well as young Russian draft dodgers fleeing military conscription. The first who fled were software experts. That was obvious. In an organized way, several companies did it in an organized manner. There are around 2,000 programmers who arrived in Montenegro. That was not individually, but employees that have been relocated by certain companies. 2000. Montenegro is home to just 620,000 people and once enjoyed close ties with Russia, but relations have soured over its decision to join NATO. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The Finnish government has been putting underground shelters to use. An emergency shelter in Helsinki was built in 2003 and doubles as a sports facility. It's one of many shelters in the capital that provide cover for the city's 650,000 residents. After that we have a... Journalists on Wednesday were offered a glimpse of the facility, which emergency service officers say can house up to 6,000 people and could even be used in case of a nuclear attack. The first barrier of the safety is the corridor where you come came in. So the uh, drop from the uh, surface level is taking the most of the blast uh, effects away. The tour came just a week after Finland officially submitted its bid to join NATO, a decision spurred by the country's alarm over Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Finland shares an 800-mile border with Russia. The shelter is located underground and serves as a sports facility as well as a parking lot, but can be reverted to a shelter within 72 hours. But I knew that, that uh, most of the countries have some civil defense schemes and civil defense shelters, but they are not uh, uh, concerned concerning the citizens. They are concerning some of the top governmental officials or, or some with a lot of money. But in Finland, we, we, we need to uh, uh, keep the normal citizens safe. According to the city of Helsinki's governmental portal, there are approximately 5,500 other shelters. The facilities have enough capacity to house those living and visiting the capital in case of a strike. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Record high inflation has led to new measures in Germany that ease the burden on consumers, including massively discounted travel on public transport. Here are the details. Europeans are enduring record high inflation and it's forcing some authorities to take action. On Wednesday, Germany introduced a new measure to help consumers get by. Locals can now buy public transport tickets that cover travel across Germany for just €9, Euros, or a little under $10 a month. I think it's good, because I'm telling myself now, every week I'll travel somewhere and look at whatever things I want to. Now so many people are taking the train, and that's why I think that soon there'll be issues with overcrowded trains. The German railway has said they can arrange for more trains to run, at least not as many as might be needed. Therefore, I'm a bit afraid that in summer you may want to travel somewhere, but you can't because the trains are too overcrowded. Germany's government has also lowered taxes on fuel to fight high prices. Some petrol stations in Germany have already lowered their prices to the delight of many customers. But others were more sceptical about the tax relief actually reaching them. I haven't noticed anything until now. I filled my car last week with diesel for €1.92 and today the diesel costs €1.97. So it's not really noticeable. The measures are due to run for three months until the end of August. Inflation in Germany rose to 7.9% in May, largely due to supply chain issues caused by the health crisis and the conflict in Ukraine. Coming up, more Taiwan residents are learning how to shoot. This to protect the island from a potential takeover by the Chinese communist regime. Interest has skyrocketed since the Ukraine war began. All that and more after the short break.
The head of the FBI says Iranian government-backed hackers were behind an attempted hack last year. It was on Boston's Children's Hospital's computer network. Christopher Ray says the FBI was able to help thwart the hackers before they damaged the hospital's computer network. But he says it's an example of the potential of high-impact hacking threats the U.S. faces from Iran, Russia, China, and North Korea. Iran and North Korea also continue to carry out sophisticated intrusions targeting U.S. victims. In fact, in the summer of 2021, hackers sponsored by the Iranian government tried to conduct one of the most despicable cyber attacks I've ever seen right here in Boston when they decided to go after Boston Children's Hospital. The ultimate goals of the hospital attackers are not clear. Ray had said in March that Iranian government-linked hackers were behind a cyber attack on a children's hospital, but he didn't name the hospital. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the threat posed by the Chinese Communist regime to a rules-based world order is the most serious long-term challenge facing the United States. We can't uh, rely on Beijing to change its own trajectory. Uh, What we can do and what we're working to do is to shape the strategic environment around Beijing to advance our positive vision for an open, inclusive international system. I believe China wants a world order, which is good because order is is usually better than the alternative. Uh, But the profound difference is this. The order that we've sought to build, very imperfectly, but that we sought to build is profoundly liberal in nature. The order that China seeks is illiberal. We disagree. And it's, as, and it's as basic and fundamental as that. Blinken says he hopes Beijing sees how the world has come together to support Ukraine and put extraordinary pressure on Russia. Blinken says the Chinese regime is looking at the situation very closely. He says he wants to make sure the U.S. has its deterrence and defenses built up against any potential threats posed by the regime. Blinken was speaking to the Council on Foreign Relations. He says it's important for the Chinese regime to take the right lessons from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And he said they should understand the impact of the international community's response. He also said the Biden administration wants to lead the international bloc that's opposed to Russia's invasion into a broader coalition. It would counter what it sees as a more serious long-term threat to global order from Beijing. Some in Taiwan are taking shooting lessons for the first time in their lives. They are concerned about Russia's invasion of Ukraine and worry that their neighbor China may have similar ideas. Here's more. Taiwanese who have never held a gun before are taking shooting lessons for the first time, as Russia's invasion of Ukraine ramps up anxiety. Their fear is that giant neighbor China could make a similar move on the democratic island. Taiwan tightly controls gun ownership and the use of these airsoft guns, which are similar to BB guns, is taught for competitions. China's growing military pressure on the island it claims as its own, combined with the conflict in Ukraine, has spurred debate about how to boost defences in Taiwan, including whether to extend compulsory military service. Max Chiang is CEO of Polar Light, a combat skills training company. Um, At the moment, the number of people participating in this kind of activity in Taiwan is currently increasing. This has been already a trend in the past two years. Since Chinese fighter jets started flying close to Taiwan, there has been an increase. After the Ukraine war started, the numbers have tripled or quadrupled. More and more people are coming to take part. Some in Taiwan fear that China, which has never ruled out using force to bring the island under its control, may take advantage of a West distracted by the Ukraine conflict. It is only because of the Ukraine war that I more urgently started feeling the threat from China. Therefore, I decided to gain some deeper knowledge about these defensive weapons. In the past, before the start of the war, I was mostly interested in first aid. Tattoo artist Su Chun was determined to learn how to use the air guns. In case of war, the country will notify reservists to gather in a certain location and then hand out guns and other equipment. Because most likely, there will be teams made up of many people. I think there will certainly be all kinds of people. Those who are prepared, people who aren't prepared, and also those who are panicking. I think all those types of people will be there. I am sure that most people don't want to go to war, 
I also don't want to go to war. But in the unfortunate event of this really happening, I will be mentally prepared. Taiwan has raised its alert level but has reported no unusual military movements by Beijing. But some politicians in Taiwan have urged the public to start thinking about survival plans. The U.S. and Taiwan agreed to a new trade initiative. It was announced after a virtual meeting between trade officials from the two nations on Wednesday. We hear more about this from an expert on Taiwan. Please welcome Riley Walters, who is the deputy director of the Hudson Institute Japan Chair. Thank you for making the time, Riley. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, Taiwan's top trade negotiator, Zhang Dong, he called the new trade agreement between the U.S. and Taiwan a historic breakthrough. What are the implications of this new agreement? I think there's a lot of hope that this agreement could actually lead to something more. Uh, you know, the, the Tsai administration has been pretty adamant about securing a, a free trade or a bilateral trade agreement with the United States. And I think perhaps Dung is hoping that this could be the, the stepping stones or the building blocks for something uh, a little bit more concrete like that. But the deal itself is pretty good. I mean, it covers so many different areas and could potentially lead to something meaningful. Uh, you know, only time will really tell at this point. What does it say about the U.S. commitment to the region? I think the U.S. commitment is there. You know, the Biden administration has been pretty strong on uh, strengthening its diplomatic relationships in, in the region since it came into the office. Um, the only thing I, I kind of wished that had happened was that you know, Taiwan was included in the, the larger uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework that was uh, announced just a week earlier than that. So would you say that China is going to be displeased with this? <laughs> I think China will be displeased with anything that the United States does uh, regarding Taiwan or not regarding Taiwan in the region. Um, I, I think they're upset that uh, obviously the Indo-Pacific economic framework was launched. They're upset that this new uh, trade initiative with Taiwan was launched. But uh, one thing I would note is I don't think they're upset that Taiwan wasn't included in their uh, economic framework because uh, in a way it does kind of keep uh, Taiwan isolated in the international community, uh, even though U.S.-Taiwan bilateral relationship is, is so strong. Can you unpack some of the specifics of what this trade agreement actually means? Yeah, it, it covers so many different things. Um, so many things actually I think we're already talking about at a bilateral level, but you know, supply chains is a very is a very important topic uh, these days. Obviously, considering the last two years, digital economic issues are very important, given the transformation of our economies into more digital and services oriented economies. Uh, there's also other things, um, you know, not not as as uh, fun things, but still necessary things around regulatory reform. Um, rules and standardization, uh, things that can potentially lay out uh, a good uh, road for future development. Taiwan is a major semiconductor producer. How does that play into this? I think it plays an important part. Uh, semiconductors is, is obviously something this administration has been looking at. Uh, you know, they're trying to pass legislation through Congress on, on semiconductor investment. Building the relationship with Taiwan and the semiconductors is really important in two regards. One, it, it's, it's making sure that uh, Taiwan is secure as it continues to develop these technologies, but also to make sure that those technologies don't fall into the wrong hands. And so I think uh, it, it will become a major focal point of this conversation, but I think there's also potentially another uh, uh, framework that may or may not come out with uh, not just the United States, but hopefully with uh, Japan and South Korea as well. Riley Walters at the Hudson Institute, thank you so much for your analysis. Up next, climate and sunshine produce unusual grapes in Chile's desert. They are made into wines with exotic flavors. Stay tuned to find out more. See China before communism. Behold, a splendid culture reborn, filled with beauty, majesty, and a powerful message of hope. Come see the performance that has touched the hearts of millions, live on stage, coming to Jones Hall, June 3rd through the 5th. Shenyun.com slash Houston, 877-663-7469. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast, cable, or print media, has become extremely biased. 
And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times, I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff. I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased, and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epic Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. Yo, camping buddy. Okay, you guys ready? Dude, I thought you were driving. I thought you were driving. Oh, I never said I was driving. Well, I definitely can't drive. <laughs> if you're high, just don't drive. It's illegal everywhere. If you feel different, you drive different. Inside Chile's Atacama, the world's driest desert, a winery is thriving. Their extreme temperatures and intense sunlight give these grapes a unique flavor. Let's take a look. In between the highland peaks of Chile's Atacama Desert grows a special grape. The fruits are brewed into wines that boast bold flavors. One of the identities of our wines is that they express the place of origin very well. We don't want to lose the essence of that salt taste, that desert taste, that volcanic rock taste, and the grapes' flavors which are distinctive. The grapes of Caracoles Vineyard can withstand harsh weather at an altitude of over 10,000 feet. We have 360 days of sunshine and ultraviolet radiation. We have freezing nights, and this makes our red grapes generate a thicker skin. Therefore, in a natural way of the place, we have red wines with very good color, very good tannin, very versatile aroma. A total of 18 producers make up the local farmers cooperative. They produce the wine known as Ayiyu. It has won international awards with an annual production of about 12,000 bottles. But the success has not been easy to come by. We have to tell the truth. It is challenging to make wine here. The young people don't want to work in agriculture. They want to do something else. We are working in agriculture and we are going to continue until we can every day with more effort and dedication. Local winemakers say that other challenges like strong sunlight have actually become assets that contribute to the wine's unique flavor. A meteor shower brought pieces of cosmic rock into our atmosphere that shone in the night sky in the early hours Tuesday morning. Experts predicted that around 100,000 meteors would be recorded per hour with better visibility in the northern hemisphere, though they are also appeared to observers in the southern hemisphere, including Brazil. The Heller and Jung Space Observatory recorded the fall of one meteor lasting 9.9 seconds, being the longest recorded in 2022. It entered the atmosphere at an altitude of 55 miles and died out over the ocean. The recording was made by two cameras at the observatory, both of them located in Puerto Alegre. And in Switzerland, a Japanese samurai sword from antiquity. AFP says authorities discovered the sword during a routine search of a car. Officials say it was made in the year 1353 and is worth about $700,000. So how did it get there? Swiss border security says they found it a contract and sales invoice in the car. They told the outlet the driver had not registered the sword at a border crossing, which violated Swiss law. Those laws are meant to protect against looting, theft, and smuggling of cultural property. A criminal investigation pinpointed the culprit, the driver's employer. He will be fined about $6,000. A captain has been fired after he fell asleep while on duty last month. The flight was AZ-609 on Italian air carrier ITA from New York to Rome. According to local media, traffic controllers were unable to get in touch with it for up to 10 minutes as it passed through French airspace. This sparked fears among French authorities about terrorist hijackings. The captain argued that the communication breakdown was caused by equipment failure, but the claim has raised doubts. 
ITA engineers said they found no fault with the equipment. The Telegraph said the co-pilot was also taking a control break at the time, which was allowed by procedure, but the captain was supposed to stay awake. The company's spokesman explained that the flight was on autopilot and the safety of passengers was never compromised. And new spacesuits are on the way. NASA has selected Axiom Space and Collins Aerospace to develop the next generation of spacesuits and spacewalk systems to work outside the International Space Station. Although we'll often call the spacesuit the world's smallest spacecraft, it's, uh, it's human-shaped, human-sized. It shouldn't feel like a spacecraft. We want to be, be able to create an immersive environment that, for the crew member, gives them the most amount of mobility. Dan's told you a whole bunch of the stuff he's been involved in. That's in prototype type suits that ultimately inform the design. So there's still, at least in our case, there's still work to do to finalize uh, some of the design and you get informed by the work you're doing. The new suits will be used to explore the lunar surface on Artemis missions and to prepare for human missions to Mars. Just ahead, have you ever heard of a sport called picketball? It's currently the trendiest and fastest growing sport in the U.S., and it's very easy to play for people of all ages. Find out more after the short break. It's the French Open right now, but another paddle sport that mixes elements of tennis, badminton, and ping pong is quickly gaining popularity in the U.S. Let's take a look at pickleball. According to the Sports and Fitness Industry Association, pickleball is the trendiest and fastest growing sport in the U.S. Some 4.8 million people currently play from coast to coast, nearly double the number from just a few years ago. USA Pickleball Ambassador Sonny Tannen has played an active role in expanding the sport. Pickleball, basically the number one thing about it, it's probably the most fun and social sport that you can ever play. It's the one rare sport that you can have every age, every generation, every background, ethnicity, doesn't matter where you come, walk of life, pick up this sport and you can be, just have a, you can have a good time at it. You can be good or you can just be a recreational player. Pickleball was born in the summer of 1965 in Washington State. Three dads were looking for a game the whole family could play and named the sport after one of their dogs, Pickles. Fans of the sport share why they like pickleball and how it has changed their lives. I lost another 10 pounds, you know, it, it's, it's just amazing, it's just amazing, you know, and I'm more active, you know, I find myself, I have more energy because I'm running a lot on the court, you know, and it's, it's not as, it's not very heavy on the body. You know, I told myself, you know, I'm going to first start out with pickleball and then I'll transition back to tennis since I, since I haven't played tennis for such a long time, but you know, ever since then, I've only stuck with pickleball and I've completely ditched tennis. According to the Pro Pickleball Association, Ben Johns is currently ranked the world's number one pickleball player. I think it means a lot, uh, not so much just as personal accomplishment, but uh, because the sport's new and it's, uh, it's growing a lot, it's kind of, you don't get to be on the, on the edge of a sport growing very often, right? It's very rare. So to be uh, the best at something while it's growing is just a unique experience and uh, definitely feel, um, you know, very um, fortunate that that uh, has happened. The popularity of pickleball has a lot to do with how easy and cheap it is to play it. Four pickleball courts can fit in the same space as one tennis court, and it requires little more than a net, a paddle, and a perforated plastic ball. Alan Alcantara played a lot of baseball growing up in the Dominican Republic, sometimes without a glove. When the Mets' Starling Marti ripped a home run in his direction at City Field on Tuesday night, it didn't matter that he was holding Levi, his one-year-old son. He had a free hand, and that's all he needed. The 31-year-old reached over a railing from his seat in center field and caught the first inning homer barehanded, all while cradling little Levi with his other arm. As soon as I saw the ball coming off the bat, I knew it was coming my way. I didn't know if it was going to be a home run or not, but I got ready. I, I knew I was not going to have time to put the baby down, <laughs> so I decided to just hold, up, hold on tight to him, jump on the rail, and see if I could catch the ball. And, we did. We how did it. how did Levi react? Um, he was really shocked and he was surprised because he's never seen his dad act that way. So pretty sure he was scared. 
The SNY broadcast captured the grab with stunned play-by-play man Gary Cohen asking, did he catch that? And declaring, this man will go viral. The Alcantaras were at the game between Washington and the Mets as part of an organized church group and other members watching from home also reached out quickly when they saw the catch. Toothbrushes, toothpaste, shampoo, and conditioners are the little things that we start our days with. But to homeless people, these little things could be life-changing. Maria Castro is the founder of Love Purse, a nonprofit organization with a mission to provide homeless women with purses filled with necessities. Last March, Castro's mission started with a request for help from a safe haven, also a nonprofit organization supporting homeless people to get back on their feet. During the pandemic, people weren't able to share anything. And so everybody needed to have individualized soap, shampoo, conditioners, you know, toothpaste. A safe haven saw a large influx of women seeking shelter due to job loss or domestic violence. Castro bought the toiletries but says that giving a plastic bag of items to a woman who already feels down seems a bit insensitive. So she bought 10 purses, large enough to fit everything. I took all of the toiletries and as I started putting them in the bags, I felt this overwhelming joy and just thought to myself, I love how this feels. Like whoever opens this purse is going to know that somebody cared enough and thought about them enough to put this together. Castro says that it's important to give the women in need words of inspiration and encouragement. So she put a note and a card designed by her friend into the purses. People all over the world are praying for you. You are strong, you are resilient, you are important, you are special, you are loved. God is watching over you. After sharing her photo with the purses on Facebook, Castro's posting went viral. It just took off. The floodgates opened and people started, you know, bringing purses to a safe haven. Donations and purses began to pour in from across the country, Canada, and Mexico. And individuals and organizations even hosted purse parties to fundraise for Love Purse. Nellie Vasquez-Roland, founder of A Safe Haven, shared the reactions of the recipients and the life-changing impact. These women got these purses and were just overwhelmed with joy and appreciation. That's why we have so many people that graduate from our programs that go on and now they carry it in their own DNA, the idea of what can they do to help someone else in their time of need. Castro will be hosting a gala on October 6th to continue fundraising for this cause. Reporting by Angela Moy, NTD News. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put our email address on screen. We'd love to hear from you. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.